it would have been the biggest technology deal in corporate history. In 2017, then Singaporean semiconductor firm Broadcom offered $103 billion to buy San Diego based chipmaker Qualcomm. The takeover became hostile, and Qualcomm appealed to the government to review the deal. In an unusual move, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, CFIS, took them up on that offer, and then Trump blocked the deal on rather unusual national security grounds. This failed hostile takeover soon faded into the background as the Trump administration moved on to other newsmaking things, a lot of them, like the TikTok fiasco, for example. But even at the time, I thought the whole kerfuffle was super interesting and worth the video. So, here it is. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Patreon. For those who have not signed up to the early access tier, I want to call out that there are a few videos queued up and waiting to be released that you can watch right now. I'm going to try to keep the number at around 5, but right now it stands at 8. It will help support the channel and help pay for all this coffee I'm spending at cafes when writing the videos. So head on over to the Patreon page and take a look. I deeply appreciate anything you'd be able to sign up for, and thanks. Now on with the show. Qualcomm is a semiconductor and telecommunications company that develops products for the wireless market. Founded in 1985, it went public in 1991 on the NASDAQ stock exchange. The company established itself for its early research into wireless cell phone standards such as CDMA. Standards like CDMA are best described as ways to transmit and receive data streams over radio waves. After some controversy, CDMA was brought into the 3G standard. 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, and so on. These are just general labels for referring to generations of mobile telecommunications technology. Technologies which are then adopted by various telecoms around the world. CDMA being accepted as a 3G standard made Qualcomm's patents extremely valuable. The company has since been involved in the 4G and 5G standards. Its business model is to spend a whole lot on R&D to develop commercial wireless technologies and then license those out to suppliers and operators. Those license fees are the most profitable bits of the company. The company known as Broadcom is a weird beast. We can trace it back to a Singaporean company known as Avago Technologies. Avago was spun off from the chip division of Agilent Technologies, which in turn was spun off from Hewlett Packard. Private equity firms KKR and Silver Lake teamed up with Singaporean state investors Temasek and GIC to found Avago Technologies. They levered up a $1.3 billion investment to pony up the $2.7 billion to purchase the company. When the company went public in 2009, the investor group made a handsome sum of money. Knowing about Avago's private equity background helps you better understand their style of business. The company is known for its frequent acquisitions and takeovers. Once they have acquired the company, they radically cut expenses including R&D and focus on financially maximizing what they call their big franchises. They did this for a variety of companies including the $37 billion 2015 acquisition of the venerable Broadcom Corporation. When Avago took over Broadcom, they took the name as well, and now they are aiming for Qualcomm. In November 6, 2017, Broadcom made a $103 billion offer to buy Qualcomm. This offer was almost immediately rejected by the Qualcomm board as being way too low. The takeover attempt soon became hostile, and Broadcom began to reach out to Qualcomm shareholders so that it would be able to switch out the board's members. And that was when Qualcomm reached out to CFIS. CFIS stands for the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. It's an interagency committee headed by the Secretary of the Treasury, but also includes the Secretary of Defense, State, and more. Together, CFIS reviews foreign transactions and investment for whether or not the acquisition can stand to be a potential threat to national security. For example, if the foreign investment could result in foreign control of a U.S. company that makes military hardware. Broadcom is a Singaporean company. If you recall, its predecessor Avago had Temasek and GIC as substantial foundation investors. Being in Singapore allowed it to better evade certain corporate taxes, yes, but it also maintains a large workforce here. So it's not the same as those Cayman Island shell companies in China. But in November 2nd, 2017, four days before the Qualcomm offer, 
The company announced that it was redomiciling itself to Delaware. Broadcom CEO Hok Tan and Trump had a big press conference announcing it. Both parties did the conference ostensibly to promote the president's big tax reform proposal. But it also is likely that the relocation had something to do with an acquisition already in progress, that of storage networking company Brocade, and it was being held up due to CFIS review. Broadcom believed that by moving to the United States, it could avoid that review. It also believed that it would let them avoid CFIS review of the Qualcomm acquisition as well. Qualcomm was already doing the standard anti-takeover procedures, but in January 2018, it also filed a notice with CFIS. Urged by politicians on both parties, CFIS quickly announced that it would review the Broadcom and Qualcomm proxy battle. The board election would be postponed by 30 days. CFIS sent over a letter to Broadcom expressing its concern about the situation. The letter took into consideration Broadcom's private equity style and said that applying that to Qualcomm would threaten the company's leadership position and telecommunication standards. And if Qualcomm were to lose its leadership placement, then Chinese companies like Huawei and ZTE would fill the void. Such a situation would have negative consequences on American national security. They also noted their concern about the debt load incurred on the combined company and how it would force management to focus extensively on short-term profit. In its immediate response, Broadcom did not address the substantive arguments of the CFIS letter. Rather, it made an angry, emotional outburst. In it, they wrote, This was a blatant, desperate act by Qualcomm to entrench its incumbent board of directors and prevent its own stockholders from voting for Broadcom's independent director nominees. They mentioned the fact that Broadcom was in the midst of moving from Singapore to the United States, and so they added, Upon completion of the redomiciliation, Broadcom's proposed acquisition of Qualcomm will not be a CFIS-covered transaction. Of course, they probably should say that because I get the sense that CFIS hit the nail on the head. Broadcom has to gut Qualcomm and its R&D-driven business model in order to turn a profit and make the acquisition work. It is literally how they had operated up to this point. In March 2019, Broadcom posted a letter to Congress that said, among other things, that it would not sell any sensitive assets to foreign buyers and support the development of 5G technology in the United States. They would invest $3 billion in R&D and $6 billion in manufacturing out of the United States area. Of course, other companies like AT&T have made similar-ish pledges before and gone back on them. Who is going to actually try to unwind the acquisition years after it has been consummated? Furthermore, their letter proves the math. Qualcomm alone spent $6 billion in R&D in FY 2020 alone. To do $3 billion in R&D across a combined Broadcom-Qualcomm entity is a pretty clear statement of intent. The Broadcom people met with the Trump administration in a last-ditch effort to save the deal. Their CEO, Tan, who I believe became a U.S. citizen in 1993, but I cannot be sure, explained that he held top security clearance and had been a CEO for a company that made U.S. military hardware components. In other words, a bona fide American patriot. I do think Broadcom was right when it argued that once it became an American company, Cephas would have no jurisdiction over the transaction. That might have needed testing in court, though. But Trump made the question irrelevant. Before Cephas could issue a decision, Trump issued an executive order on March 12, 2018, blocking the deal. Broadcom withdrew, Qualcomm reshuffled their independent board members, and is today a $165 billion company, far above the $103 billion offering price. Broadcom, for its part, completed its redomicile and eventually purchased an IT software company called CA Technologies. Cephas did not get involved with that deal. Broadcom today is a $193 billion company. Broadcom's style of operating reminds me of another private equity story, 3G Capital. 3G is a famous, very famous, private equity group that owns some of the biggest consumer brand companies in the world. For example, they own and run Anheuser-Busch InBev, the biggest beer company in the world, Restaurant Brands International, which owns Burger King, Tim Hortons, and Popeyes, and Kraft Heinz, maker of that mac and cheese and ketchup. Warren Buffett has been a big backer of theirs. They hand out this book called How to Double Your Profits in Six Months or Less. It's their internal Bible. 
They ruthlessly cost cut with something called zero-based budgeting, a budgeting style in which all expenses need to be justified for each new period. Where before you roll over the next year and modify as needed with ZBB, each year you restart from scratch. 3G's business style is to first buy a fat, stagnant consumer company, invest money in what it believes are its best parts, i.e. its franchises, and fire or sell off everything else. This style is lean and mean and gets financial results. When 3G bought out Heinz in 2013, it managed to raise its gross margins from the mid-teens to an amazing 28%. That's astounding for a big company in a mature space. They also fired a lot of people and closed a few factories, but that's the deal. Broadcom is 3G Capital's style adapted to the semiconductor business. Broadcom's view is that, over the years, companies in the semiconductor space, like Qualcomm, have gotten to be large incumbents. Large, bloated, and bureaucratic incumbents with lots of senior employees that are out of date, unmotivated, and incompetent. They get big salaries and block the way upwards for the younger people, who soon leave. CEOs don't want to fire these underperforming senior employees, so they put them in charge of underperforming divisions that just end up wasting resources. Broadcom comes in and fires them. They replace those top underperforming employees with younger people who might be able to do a better job. And that's fine, if they're more productive. But even if they are, then again, what happens to the guy who lost a job and the family they support? Now, in the defense of private equity investors, I want to mention something. 3G is not just a vicious cost-cutting machine. Their overall goal is to not only get leaner, but to also invest in the best-performing bits of the organization, something that Tan from Broadcom calls franchises. That means those younger people they brought in might even get paid more than the senior person who got fired, so they don't mind spending a lot on something they think is worth it. Many people think that the Qualcomm block is about China, and that's what the headlines certainly say. It might be, but I also get the sense that it's also about saving thousands of high-paying jobs. Cephas just happened to have the jurisdiction to get involved. I guess I can leave you with one last thing. 3G bought Heinz in 2013 and then merged with Kraft Foods in 2015. Margin soared, like I said, and things seemed peachy. Then they tried to buy Unilever, one of the biggest food companies in the world, but failed. And without that next big hit to cut the fat on, problems began to crop up a few years later. Consumer taste had changed to favor healthier organic products, and the company did not have the right mix to appeal to them. The stock fell, and the company struggled. It struggles to this day. I do think that Broadcom is doing something interesting in the semiconductor and now corporate software space. It is going to change the way the industry works, and it's going to make a lot of people and investors rich. But I sometimes wonder if we are getting a bit too much capitalism here, and need to think a little more strategically. When Intel brought back Pat Gelsinger to be its CEO, people cheered because an engineer is in charge. Yet Broadcom is almost as valuable as Intel, $190 billion versus $240 billion, Despite less profit and being run by the financial engineers, people don't seem to like. So you can say that the market favors the Broadcom model over the Intel model. And I think that's a problem in the industry's long-run competitiveness. All right, take care of yourselves out there. Um, if you enjoy the video essays you find on this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. I come out with videos pretty frequently now. Um, and check out the Patreon. All right, guys, take care of yourselves out there. See you later.